This is Woodbury Wright's podcast, and I'm your host, Sandy Carlson. I'm here today with Tom Tessier of Watertown, Connecticut. Tom has been a journalist and a publishing director, born in Waterbury. Tom has lived in Dublin for six years and London for seven. Over the course of his career, he has written novels, novellas, short stories, poems, and plays. His books are available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, eBay, Audible, and Apple Books. You can find out more about Tom after our conversation on his website, thomastessier.com. Thanks for joining us today, Tom. It's great to have you here at the library. Thank you very much, Sandy. Glad to be here. You have uh, a long and, and illustrious career as a writer. And I know you as a writer of horror. Um, would you just ex- to, uh, introduce yourself to our listeners as an audience? How long have you been writing and what is your focus? Oh, I think I started writing around the age of 13 or 14. Growing up, I, grew, I was born in Waterbury, grew up in Naugatuck, and uh, just down the street from my grammar school uh, was the Naugatuck Library. And I loved uh, stories from childhood. My mother used to read to us uh, every night. And uh, and I loved the, the, the let's hear it for uh, our public libraries. Uh, I used to love the Naugatuck. I still do love going to the library, the public library. I loved the reading room there. I found books of all kinds, and and I read voraciously. And eventually, found my way to poetry. I started writing poetry when I was about thirteen or fourteen, and I tried writing plays and did that for a while. It wasn't until I got into my mid-twenties that I really kind of worked up the uh, out of need because I was never really happy with the results that I got in poetry and plays for various reasons. Found my way to fiction and 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 that and I think that's where it really all started to work for me. I started writing a novel first and then went on to write short stories and novellas as well. What is it about the um, the form of fiction that that appeals to you as a writer? What does it let you do? I think it's more expansive, and and it, and for me, it allowed me to my imagination to open up and go out in different directions, and to get more involved, write at greater length, write in greater detail, and it just seemed like the most natural voice for me. I, recently, I've been, I've been reading from your collection of short pieces called World of Hurt, and the way you develop a character and, and build the tension and combine what seems very ordinary and familiar and accessible and, and take it to another level incrementally into we're as surprised as your characters are by where they are and what they're trying to make sense of. Oh, good. It's a, <laughs> I, I think it's a perfect form. What, what inspired you early on to, to try out writing? Did you have an audience you were writing for or just? Did... Well, when I started writing poetry as a, as a young teenager, uh, no, I didn't have an audience in mind. I didn't ever think of sending the poems anywhere, submitting them to a magazine or a paper. Uh, I was writing just for myself and it was, you know, mostly teenage angst and teenage love. And, uh, and it was just uh, finding what was good about it was I found that I could write, I could put down my feelings, I could put down my thoughts. And so I, once I started writing, I never stopped. What, um, what inspires you to explore the dark side of human nature when you're in your horror writing? The world around, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Ample inspiration. I, I, I guess I've always been sort of, uh, I mean, stories that are scary, uh, stories that are dramatic, those are the things that, that we all uh, kind of relate to, uh, both growing up and as adults. Uh, it's, it's, ways, uh, it's a way of seeing the world and trying to make sense out of it and make sense out of the way that people behave and reaction to what happens to them. Looking over your very beautiful website and reviewing, uh, looking at some of the reviews written about your work, one of the comments on the on Phantom was that the, 
the book captures what happens when the lights go on and the horror doesn't go away. Yeah. In in reading Father Panic's opera of the macabre, I, that that quotation just totally resonated with that that text, and not knowing if you're in his mind or in his world, and then getting to the notes at the end of the story and you find out yeah. th this is the world. Yeah, that was that was a that was a, a, a bit of a different uh, kind of a horror story for me because it was the first time I really wanted to base a story on actual historical events and the it is partly a haunted house story or but it it required i think uh, taking that historical event and not writing it as non-fiction not writing it as an actual story but putting someone in the situation where they're exposed to it in a very surprising way. Yeah, you know, and when I started reading that story, that novella, I I felt like the story made me think of some some works by Poe in terms of the mm -hmm. setting and the, the your classic horror story. And then when I got to the notes and I saw that it was based on things that actually happened in concentration camps. Right. And I'll be honest, I felt foolish because I didn't know that piece of our history. Our world history. It's a kind of a forgotten incident. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the the smaller or the lesser Holocaust. And, uh, you know, the Holocaust itself, that just it was such a, a massive horror that it's there are smaller parts of it or related parts to it that just get completely forgotten or overlooked. I, and I, I think one of the experiences I've had in reading horror, which, as I said before, wasn't my the, my go-to genre, right. um, but going there and in, engaging texts that deal with the dark things that human beings are capable of, I, I find that the genre is more honest about human nature than maybe some others in their exploration of where that comes from within us. Well, how are we capable of some of these things? And, you know, how can somebody be your lover by night and your, your afflictor by day, this person that's ready to reduce you to nothing? Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why horror and, and crime have become such uh, big players in, in the publish, in publishing world, in movies and television and the arts. Uh, when I first started writing horror stories back in the uh, 1970s, there were no publishers who would who would admit to publishing horror the what we call horror books now or ghost stories the ones that stood out were shirley jackson's the house on haunted hill the exorcist was it was a huge influence in the publishing world and in the reading world as was rosemary's baby but those publishers would tell you they weren't publishing horror at that time. They were publishing bestsellers. And that's how they thought of those books. But all that kind of began to really change when Steve King came along. And Steve made horror. He put it on the map. He gave it respectability simply because of the volume of sales and the recognition that there was something going on here that horror is not something that lives in a little ghetto it's everybody relates to it one way or another absolutely and uh, you know being one of those watchers of crime television mm -hmm. uh, i inherited that from my my mother she loved uh, yeah. law and order and yeah. svu and it's i i find when 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 there's an ending and somebody's brought to justice there's some satisfaction right. that makes it possible to get through the next news cycle yes in some way <laughs> there's some kind of some right. kind of therapeutic value in that and when right. when those shows drag on capturing the criminal yeah. episode after episode it it's it gets a little tedious and and draining yeah. you know um and and with your work with the shorter pieces you preserve that unity of effect and get to some place where if all the questions aren't answered, you you are sharing the questioning with a writer who's brought literary value to those questions, and we're not just horrified, but right. there's a there's a narrative there and identifiable characters. Um, 
You, you mentioned uh, Stephen King. Is is he a favorite author, or is there an author that's influenced you most as a writer? Oh gosh, uh, as as a horror writer, Steve is obviously a big influence, a big factor in how my work was received and many other people's work. Um, and he opened up, you know, the marketplace for a lot of good horror writers. There are far too many writers who I admire. Uh, and who I think were influenced me. I, I think we're all influenced by just about everybody we, we read and and admire to one degree or another. But uh, I mean, other another horror writer who was a huge factor in my life was Peter Straub, an old friend of mine who just recently passed. And we we both started out writing horror at the same time together. We met in Dublin uh, in years, and then also both happened to be living in London at the same time. So he is one of my all-time favorites. Right, and he has said of your work that you um, you bring unexpected poetry and subtlety to horror, and I think that's that's amazing. Um, and I, you know, I think the pulp fiction that I grew up with, that was horror. Yeah. You, you know, you're just there to be scared and, and yeah. it's some kind of weird little cathartic thing and off you go. Right. But there is literary merit in the, in the genre. Um, and part of that is the work that goes into constructing a story. Can you just speak to the kind of research and um, that, that might go into into your work? Well, first, let me just follow on what we were just talking about. A big influence in my life, probably the very first horror writer I ever read, of course, was Poe. And I loved Poe's work. And he led me to other people. And I grew up in that time when the Twilight Zone was a big deal. And the Saturday afternoon matinees that had horror movies uh, that nobody else paid attention to except kids, all of that was, was influential in my life. Research, I've done a fair amount of research over the years on certain stories. Mostly it doesn't have, it, it's more about trying to get facts right. If I'm writing about a place I like to know more about the history of a couple of my novels and uh, stories are set in London. I did a lot of research while, while I was living there to get to know the city better and to, and to know more of the history of it. It's the same thing in New England. We have a long history of horror and horrific historical events in New England. And uh, Hawthorne was another big influence on, my, on me, I, I, I think. And so I've always I've always loved reading that and looking that up and understanding as much as I can about Connecticut, Massachusetts, and the rest of New England, and the history that this whole area is just so rich in. I, I hear you, and I you know there's uh, the story that the very building we're in is haunted from way back when the the gallery portion of the building. Uh -huh. Was a <laughs> was a schoolhouse. I haven't seen the ghost, but I've heard the shutters bang against the exterior. So who knows? Um, so that verisimilitude is part of what makes the the text so convincing, and it's yeah. easy to to see the landscape that you're describing. Right. Um, so the the research question also seems to link to the the notion of of location and. I'm just wondering, can you say say more about the role of place in your in your writing? How does that come into play for you? Uh, sometimes it's very specific. Um, but for instance, my novel Rapture was set in the Narctuck Valley and I grew up there. I knew it very well. I was really very comfortable writing about it. And a couple of others, my first novel, The Fates, is also set in the same area. I made, uh, I made use of, of, I changed names, of course, but it's, tracks on the ground. It's it's uh, very solid. Right. Have you said anything very close to home in, in the sort of greater Waterbury area? Um, a couple of stories that I'm actually working on in the process are set there. Yeah. Oh, exciting. And, uh, and, and there's another story uh, I'll just mention it, talking about history and uh, verisimilitude. Uh, there is another story uh, that I've tried to do something with and I haven't, but I still love the idea. There's a house in the greater Waterbury area. I won't say where it is, but uh, years ago, a, a couple bought a big house and they were planning to redo it. And you can see, these are, this is a typical story in the horror field. 
move to a new house, uh oh, something happens. Well, they wanted to they wanted to uh, bring it up to date. It was an old house, and uh, submitted plans to, uh, to the town hall, it, which included redoing the entire cellar, which was an old New England cellar. And when they submitted their plans, the person at the town hall replied and said, "What are you going to do about the grave?" And they said, "What oh, grave?" Boy. And they said, well, in that house, someone was buried in the cellar. Oh, boy. <laughs> and there are laws that pertain to what you can do and cannot do with a grave. Oh, no. <laughs> so I still haven't, uh, I still haven't uh, quite figured out if, if or what I would do with that. But it's the kind of thing that you could stumble across in local history that I absolutely love. That sounds like a great story. Oh, you, you know, there was recently a... Um... New York Times published a piece about Victorian houses and how they were made in the, the, the you know, the chemicals in the paint, the lead in the paint and right. all this and the yeah. creating the effects of being haunted houses and maybe the, you know, the lead having an effect on people's thinking and stuff. I think yeah. I prefer the haunted theory. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, you know, you mentioned um, Stephen King and it, it just actually made me think of a, a trip I took with my parents many, many years ago and we audiobooks were a big thing and they were brand new and we had the ability to play one in the car so that mm -hmm. meant we had a slightly newer car yeah. <laughs> and I remember coming home from that trip and pulling the car into the garage and we sat in the car until the story was over it was mm -hmm. uh, and I don't even remember the story but there was yeah. one of those mechanical monkeys that yeah. hit the chimes chang 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 yes. and you couldn't say that say that uh, chang 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 in our house without the, you know the hair right. on your neck standing up and i i know uh your books are are being audio recorded can you talk about the experience of what's it like to hear something that you've written that you put on the page transformed by somebody's voice into sort of a public document in that way uh, well the first one that uh, that has uh, just came out uh, back in uh, october 2022 uh, it was recorded by Chris McKenna, a very gifted actor who's originally from Watertown and uh, still uh, works in Watertown as well as in L.A. Uh, and he, as he started to record Rapture, he would send me chapter by chapter his recording, which is an unedited, uncorrected, but still the first take through. And it was, it was, it was really nice to hear somebody else reading my work, but it was also very surprising and also made me think, wow, I could have written that page better <laughs> I could, uh, or I shouldn't have had a, a change of voice at that point. Those things uh, immediately come back uh, whenever you reread or hear your work, the things that you could have improved on and done better. Uh, but basically, it was very thrilling. He did a great job. Does he do all the voices and all the characters in the text? Yes. Yeah. That's it's amazing. It's not always going to be the case. He's also, uh, my, my first novel, The Fates, he's got uh, a group of um, teenagers in the high school drama department that he's working with who are going to be playing some of the teenagers in the story. That's terrific. So does he plan to audio record all of your, your body of work or? Yeah, that's the, that's, that's his plan right now. Yeah. That's a significant undertaking. How many books have you got all together, Tom? That would be 10 novels. And then he also is planning to do podcasts of my short stories. What has inspired him to take on this amazing project? Partly, uh, I've known Chris since he was a, a youngster in school in Watertown. Uh, he and my son are, are old, old friends, and they've stayed in touch over the years. So I'm very familiar with his career, and he's read my stories and things for years, and he's always wanted to do it. Well, that's that's terrific. And these are the books that are available on Audible, right? Yeah. And and so you mentioned that you had a couple stories in the works. What 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 can we look forward to seeing that you're uh, producing in the near future? I've got a couple of stories uh, that uh, will be coming out later this year in anthologies will go towards my next collection of short stories, which I don't have a title for it yet. And I still have a few more stories to write. And I'm also, I'm also always working on a novel. Got it. And I, I know um, World of Hurt, you dedicated to your, your four grandchildren. That's right. 
when 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 they're older and they look back on your your canon of work, how will they remember their their grandpa? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fondly, I hope they're adorable. The, although they're they adorable. are, they are. You have a beautiful family, and I I think um, I you know I saw the dedication when I got the book out, and I thought, wow, what a what a treasure to have to you know to explore the world with you through your stories and and human nature and what a resource as a young person making sense of the world around them to know that yep there are hard questions that that beg answers well i i've i've told them all along i've encouraged them to write but even more than that i said if you don't want to write or it's not you that don't worry about it but keep reading reading is the most important and are they are they readers they are very much excellent Oh, Tom, thank you so much for your time today talking about uh, you as a writer and, and the field of horror literature. It's It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Steve.